This is Philly Drone Tech with Tom Brunt. Thank you to our sponsors, Wistia.com, Zoho Mail, and GetFlywheel.com. Hello, welcome to another edition of Philly Drone Tech here on the phillytech.org netcast network. I'm Tom Brunt. Uh, well, uh, the Christmas season is uh, now, by the time you see this, is now over. And, uh, well, I'm guessing a number of you uh, that are watching this uh, just got yourself a quadcopter for Christmas, otherwise known as a drone. So now I bet you're wondering what to do now. Uh, how do you have fun with it? And uh, there's a couple things you need to know about it. So I'm hoping to use this episode of my podcast uh, for all the, uh, the new folks out there. Uh, that are just getting into this uh, fantastic hobby and uh, what you need to know to fly, uh, fly uh, safely and have fun. So I'll, uh, I'll get back to a new episode uh, next time uh, where I, I visited the, uh, the, the Government Video Expo and Drone Show. Uh, it's an event they have every year and for the first time they had a section for drones. And uh, there's a lot of good, uh, there's some some clips I'm showing you here right now. A lot of good info that I picked up from this thing. A lot of seminars, I talked to people from the FAA, and uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot I can talk about. So that'll be my next episode uh, sometime in January. Uh, but for now, um, for all those folks uh, seeing me for the first time, I guess I'll explain a little bit who I am. Uh, well, I've, uh, I'm a broadcast technician, uh, and uh, I've worked in video production and uh, broadcast engineering for a uh, couple decades and uh, well I live in uh, Doylestown and uh, I kind of got uh, bitten by the uh, by drones uh, about uh, back in the end of uh, 2013 uh, I bought my first drone and uh, I, I immediately saw its potential for uh, videography and, and photography uh, which is you know part of what I do and uh, I well, I, I kind of really got involved with it. Um, I've, uh, I've learned a lot uh, over it. Uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly uh, things have progressed in just two years. I'm now entering my third year of doing this, and I own uh, several now. And uh, I've done what I think have turned out to be pretty good videos. And I'm actually um, hoping to uh, be one in line to get a commercial uh, license once the FAA makes that available, uh, possibly in the next uh, coming year. Um, when I started, there pretty much uh, there were no specific rules to handle drones. Uh, they kind of fit under the model aircraft, um, but uh, they they're, they're a little different than a model aircraft. Uh, model aircrafts aren't typically used for like photography and things because you you need like big fields to fly and and it was a, a niche market. Uh, drones have gone mainstream. It's expected that for Christmas, if you got one, uh, you're one of possibly a, a million uh, that were sold uh, this holiday season. Um, so uh, with that, um, well, now that there's a lot out there and we're a couple years into this now, the, uh, the FAA, uh, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, is uh, now has definitely taken notice and has, uh, well, they were slow to start, but they've, uh, they've really stepped up in um, well, what to do uh, to regulate these? And uh, yes, they have to be regulated. Um, think of it like uh, think of it like a, 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 if you uh, have like about 50 cars in a large like a, a shopping center parking lot, but that parking lot has no lines or no signs to guide you anywhere. Now, have those 50 cars just start driving. You can guess what kind of mess that would be. Well, that's what the sky can be like uh, if you uh, basically have no rules uh, concerning how to allow these to fly around in, in, uh, in, in airspace. So uh, with that, uh, the FAA has, um, this is their second year of, uh, of uh, working with um, a campaigns to uh, basically market toward consumers uh, that are just getting into the, uh, the hobby the first, for the first time. Uh, so um, I'm hoping to share some knowledge with you about uh, how, what to do now, now that you, you have a, uh, a drone. So, uh, well, let's get started. Uh, as, as I normally do, if you watch my podcast, I, I start the first segment talking about the FAA. 
Well, for this one, uh, I, I will bring up with the FAA because if you got one uh, of a certain size, um, you know, over half a pound, uh, you, uh, you have to register it with the FAA. It's a very, very simple process. And think of it like getting a, uh, a license plate number. Uh, you have a license plate for your car so that if you do something wrong, people can write down the license plate number and they can find you. Well, the FAA decided that they need to do that with uh, uh, drones as well. Um, uh, kind of give a forced sense of responsibility um, that if you, you realize that if you do something wrong, uh, penalties can be severe. Uh, so they are um, requiring that every hobbyist um, get a uh, get get a a, 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 um, a number for their drone. Uh, here's the website uh, for you, and I'll I'll leave links up on my uh, on a on a site uh, later on for you to go to. Um, one thing I should tell you though that um, there are a lot of people out there that are starting to market that they will for a fee of like twenty five dollars or more uh, register your drone for you. Easy. Uh, don't do this. Uh, these are people just looking for a quick buck. It couldn't be any easier of a process already. Um, all you need is a valid credit card and you're basically giving them this info. You're giving them your full name, your mailing address, email, phone number. That's it. End of story. Um, they are charging a fee of five dollars. Uh, that's per household, that's per user, not per quadcopter, per user. Um, if you do it uh, by January 20th, they are waiving that fee. Uh, basically, they will charge your credit card and immediately credit it back to you. Uh, but once you uh, successfully fill out the process, you will uh, get a number. Uh, they will email you a little certificate, a little paper certificate that you can print out and uh, carry with you. They recommend you, they, you carry this with you. Um, it's, it's kind of unknown at this point whether uh, how local law enforcement will deal with these new registration numbers. Um, that's still kind of being worked out, but it would be advisable that you have the number with you. Uh, put it in the case with your drone, uh, put it in your pocket, or you can even have it on your phone or tablet and you can show them the digital version of it if, if say, a, a park ranger comes up and asks. Um, once you get this number, you have to affix it in a visible spot on your equipment. Uh, that can be inside the battery compartment uh, if, if need be. Uh, I use uh, P-Touch uh, for mine and um, that, that's fine. You can also use a, a little dirty method, but you could use a white tape and a Sharpie marker and put it on there. But the number just has to be on there. That needs to be done before your first outdoor flight. Um, and they're, they're pretty serious about it, so I would probably do it. Um, through uh, all the conferences that I've been to uh, lately, I've I've found as I've you know kind of evolved in my knowledge and my experience of using these, and in how the FAA is taking its approach. Uh, one thing I found out through talking to reps from the FAA is that they are really really serious that uh, they consider you a hobbyist uh, as a pilot of a device that's in national airspace. Um, that makes it sound a little more serious, and, and it is. Uh, there's a lot going on up there uh, in airspace. Uh, there's your, your airports uh, and planes uh, that uh, it's, it's very critical. We have, we've had near misses, as you've probably heard about on the news, uh, but we have, we've so far have yet to have a, an actual collision with drones. And the FAA is doing their best to make sure that doesn't happen, but still allow for hobbyists to do their thing, have, have fun, but uh, there are, rules that we have to be responsible for. Um, it's not just uh, taking a little uh, RC car out on your street. Uh, you're actually up in regulated airspace with these things. Um, so the next thing is uh, that I should tell you is that which do you have a drone that needs to be registered? Um, uh, again, I'll leave links up for you, but the FAA is a good guideline of the popular models that, that uh, people are, are, are getting and whether they have to be registered or not. Basically, if it costs less than $100, chances are it's too light and small to uh, be registered. Here's, uh, here's a good example of one. This is a, this is a little, one, little guy here. 
Uh, this was about $80. It's got a little fixed camera there. And uh, yeah, I like to put faces on them. Um, so this one weighs uh, less than half a pound with the battery. Uh, this does not go, it basically can travel maybe uh, 100, 150 feet in the air. And that's if there's no wind. If you have a big wind up there, it's going to fly away because it's so light. So this is considered a toy class. Uh, a lot of you may have gotten these uh, for Christmas. And I, 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 it's great if you did because I actually, as I recommend to people that want to get involved in uh, flying uh, uh, quadcopters, start with one of these little guys. Uh, they're a little more manual. You need to kind of learn some more skills of uh, flying. But uh, you, you do get to learn skills on something that's kind of very cheap and you know they tend to bounce not crash and uh, these things here are um, well they could be anywhere from 800 to two thousand uh, dollars i wouldn't advise uh starting to learn how to fly with one of these uh just because uh, a couple reasons one uh it's it's a much more serious uh that definitely will be registered with the faa and uh it's as i tell people uh, they ask me well how how high can that can one of these fly and I give them the answer, enough to make airplanes and the FAA very nervous. And that's true. So uh, if you're new starting out, you, uh, you, you know, this is, uh, this is good to, to, to have after you get experience on one of these little guys. So even if you got one of these for Christmas, I recommend just going to like the mall or uh, store and uh, pick up one of these cheap ones, so even like $50, and uh, fly around with it. And because they, they fly basically the same way uh, as the big one. In fact, the big one has more controls to make it easier to fly. So if you can master flying one of these little guys uh, and you get used to it, then uh, uh, that's going to be cake. And then you'll be uh, ready for it. Um, so uh, there we go there. Um, and actually, here's another one here. I have a, this is a really little tiny one here. Uh, yeah, don't worry about registering this. Uh, these are uh, these are little little guys here. These are fun too. I mean, you you might have made well. They they they're starting to sell these now too. Uh, maybe your children uh, got one for your kids. Again, surprisingly, they fly very well. But again, too small and light to bother with registering. So um, now that uh, you've registered and um, you know you're ready to take it out for a flight i'm going to take a quick little sponsor break that i normally do and when i come back i'm going to give you some uh hints and tips uh with battery care and all that so um stick around i'll be right back in a few seconds today's show is sponsored by wistia wistia is a video hosting and analytics platform that helps businesses get the most out of online video we use wistia here at phillytech.org Flywheel, a managed WordPress hosting platform built specifically for designers and creative agencies and helps thousands of designers across the world launch projects every day. And by Soho Mail, professional low-cost email with business class features and security. Welcome back. Okay, well, now you uh, have it registered if it's a uh, size uh, to register with. Uh, now you're ready to take it out for your first flight. Um, I, I gave this bit of advice uh, last year uh, around uh, Christmas time with all the new uh, users and uh, I can tell you from like my own experience uh, it's it's kind of empowering when you get one of these things and you realize you can take it up into the air that's that's something that that's a neat experience that people aren't used to so the tendency is to just take it right on up and that's where you may lose it or crash it and lose control of it because you're really not expecting how it works yet. So I have a little expression I came up with last year, fly it low, fly it slow. Uh, pick a good field, good open space field, and just take it maybe 30 feet off the ground, 20, 30 feet off the ground, and, and practice flying around the space. You know, really get used to how the controls are. Uh, here's uh, this is your typical controller again this is for the toy class model but uh, even the the bigger one has the same same controls uh, and you'll probably find similar to what you have um, so yeah just 
take it slow, take it easy uh, until you get used to it. Uh, one thing that you will be surprised about is how easy it is to lose orientation. Uh, and I'll explain what that is. I'll use, uh, I'll use this guy here. Um, orientation is which way it is facing in the air relative to you. Now, normally, of course, you take it off, you sit it on the ground in front of you facing forward, and then you take it up and go forward. Okay, so here's going forward. So I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to move forward, and he's going to move forward. I'm going to move back, and he's going to move back. Okay, now that's in relation to me. I'm, I'm looking at it this way. So now what happens, though, if he ends up turning this direction? Okay, now I'm going to move forward. Which way is he going to go? He's going to go this way. That's forward now, not this way. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to, uh, it's very easy to get confused. Uh, that is another reason why to start off low and slow kind of in front of you because it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to get used to flying that way. In fact, uh, I, I could still be a lot better at it, and uh, I'm entering my third year of doing this. Um, it's very difficult to, especially when it gets farther away, uh, with the fact that these are mostly symmetrical, uh, you're not going to be able to tell up in the air how, which way it's facing. Um, so that's something to get used to. Uh, most of the, uh, this one included, most of even the toy class now has what's called headless mode or uh, uh, CL mode. Uh, CL stands for course lock. And that's a good easy way to start learning how to fly. Uh, what headless mode means is that you switch it on and you take it off in front of you facing, you know, its normal way. And then what it does is it changes, uh, it's basically orientation based on relative to where you are with the controller. So now, if I'm in headless mode, you know, forward is forward, but then if I turn it this way and I move forward, forward is still forward relative to me. So that's, um, that makes it a lot easier to control and get used to. Um, I would still recommend though, after you get used to flying that way, try doing some flights without the course lock or the headless mode. Um, the better you get at flying completely manual that way, uh, the, the better you'll be prepared for something like this. Now this, of course, has all those features of headless mode um, you know, already built in. Um, uh, when I actually started, uh, because back in, it sounds like a long time ago, but it, I mean, it sounds like it's not a long time ago, but in drone speak it, it is in 2013 I, I bought something like that first so I didn't know about the little toy class ones I'm not even sure there were a lot available uh, back then but uh, I immediately learned with course lock and it was much easier to fly so then when I got these little guys and it didn't have the course lock um, uh, havoc rained uh, on me when I immediately tried to fly it like one of these so that's another reason why I say start with one of these little guys. Uh, this is a good way to go uh, because you can you you can get your skill set in flying one of these. There's you know you have to like work at it a little bit to get it to hover straight and stuff. They're not as smooth and graceful as one of these guys. Um, but then once you do, then move on to to the big guy. Uh, but again, keep it low. Uh, fly it low. Fly it slow, as I say. Um, let me tell you about, uh, so now let's say that you are flying one of these uh, bigger ones, so, you know, one that has an FAA sticker on it. Uh, chances are it has GPS mode, which means it'll hover in place. Uh, again, that's, that's very, very nice. I mean, these are kind of meant for photography. Um, another thing you have, I mean, you might have this particular one. This is a DJI Phantom. These are like by far the most popular, uh, you know, mid-level consumer uh, drones out there uh, worldwide. Um, as you see here it is, and it weighs about, with the battery, probably about like four pounds, and it has a uh, stabilized camera on it. When this thing is running, the camera will stay in one position regardless of how the craft is, is, uh, is moving, uh, which makes for beautiful, beautiful video and photography. I'll leave links to some of the stuff I've done with this exact same model, uh, and you can see how they are. Um, one thing about these, especially for beginners, uh, they do not come with the propeller guards. So these spin very fast and they, they will hurt uh, if, if, if you land it by somebody. 
Um, for your first, for my first year, my first uh, one, I, I basically just kept the prop guards on. They're very cheap. They're like twenty dollars. And uh, here, let me pull pull them off here. What I I did actually, I got there's like an aftermarket model that are removable. So even for this one, there are times that I want to put the prop guards on it. So you just take it, and it'll just slide right on there. And then what happens is, is that uh, the chances of uh, the propeller hitting a person or an object is really uh, reduced a lot. So I like it, especially when you're starting off, uh, prop guards. Use the prop guards all the time. And even this little guy, uh, the little guys usually have prop guards. But I would use them because it saves your propellers. It'll save people too, uh, you know, if... And it could also it also is helpful to save in your craft. If you um, bump into something, uh, say with a propeller guard, you have a chance of it bouncing off. If you bump into something without a propeller guard, it's going to basically just take your your one propeller and stop it, and then your craft is coming down. So they're good for a number of reasons. So I always recommend if you're a beginner to intermediate user, prop guards, prop guards, prop guards. Next thing, if you are flying with one of these, um, most of the, uh, if they're over a couple hundred dollars, uh, they will have uh, software tweaks that you can do with them. Uh, basically, either through a, a tablet or you plug in to a USB port and you have a program on your computer to do it. This one will do it with a, a, a tablet uh, or a phone. Uh, you can set a lot of parameters in it, including uh, things such as uh, there's what's called beginner mode in a lot of them. What beginner mode means is that it will, it will only fly a certain height and distance from you, and it will also not even take off if you're too close to it. Again, safety. You know, you're a new user. You do not want this thing flying back at you or other people if you're not used to it yet. So there's beginner mode. I would recommend you start off with that. Um, also, when you get out of beginner mode, uh, then you can set things for height and distance. Um, how high can you fly? Well, the, uh, the legal limit by the FAA is 400 feet, uh, with exception. Uh, if you're within five miles of an airport, uh, that's uh, considerably less, and you really shouldn't even be flying it. But if you're, certainly if your house, if you look up and you see that you're in a direct flight path of an airport, or even a small one, and you see planes that look very, very low, um, don't fly your drone there. Uh, definitely not. What I personally like to set it for, um, because as I've been doing this more, I've been, I've been finding out that, you know, because I have to be cognizant where I live in the Doralston area, because we, we do have an airport too. Um, so you have to be pretty cognizant about that. Uh, that's something you really have to always be aware about. Um, I set mine for a, a maximum height of 200 feet, half the legal uh, height. Uh, what that means is if I try to go more than 200 feet, it'll just stay there at 200 feet. So it won't go any higher. So, and really for what you like to do with photography and stuff, I find 200 feet is plenty high. Uh, I, so I would probably err on the side of caution, make it 200 feet if you can. Uh, what I also recommend is, uh, and again, I'll leave links for it. Uh, there's this great free app called Hover. You can get it uh, for iPhone and I believe for Android as well. Uh, here's uh, some screenshots of it here. It gives you a couple indications, and then it also gives you a map, uh, and it'll show you uh, where the uh, no-fly zones are. So as you see, I'm I'm right in I'm toward the end of a of a airport no-fly zone. So technically, I shouldn't even uh, I shouldn't be flying there. Um, if your house is among that distance and you really want to fly, basically. Uh, don't go any higher than your your trees. Um, you know, if you want to practice in your in your backyard, just don't go any higher than that. Um, find a uh, field. What I, what I like to do, um, even when I travel, is I tend to try to look up uh, local parks. Uh, local parks are, are typically good. Um, right now, a lot of them haven't like made rules concerning drones yet. So if you're there, you're nice and responsible. Um, Use a local park. Uh, again, that's also good for uh, having a nice open field that you can use if you don't have one available, uh, like in your in your backyard. Um, so uh, that's that's good there. Okay, next, uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, batteries. 
the bigger ones uh, have uh, lipo batteries. You may have heard about lipo batteries. Uh, you're probably familiar with hearing all the horror stories about the hoverboards. Uh, in fact, you might have decided not to get a hoverboard for someone for Christmas because of the stories of them uh, catching on fire. Uh, those are lipo batteries. And yes, they're um, nature of the beast. Uh, they, you do have to take some care of them. Uh, this is a lipo battery for my uh, Phantom uh, Pro, uh, which is actually a smart battery. So it's got some, uh, uh, this one's actually pretty good because uh, it actually has some electronics in it and will do things like if it's sitting for too long, like I have it set for three days. If it sits for more than three days, it starts to discharge itself so that it's not full voltage sitting there in the case. Um, usually when they're fully charged sitting around, that's when they can have problems or typically charging usually causes problems. It's rare, and the media picks up on a lot of those stories, but um, it's still something to be aware of. Um, some other drones uh, might have, these are standard RC batteries. Uh, you buy these for a number of things, even RC cars and stuff will have these batteries. These batteries don't have any smarts in them. Uh, so it's best if you're storing them for a while, um, run them down, go out for a flight, and then just don't charge them uh, for a while. Um, what a lot of people like to do, uh, including myself, is uh, if you want to store these and also even with, for charging them, uh, they sell what these called uh, these fire retardant li lipo bags. Uh, they're good for any lipo battery, actually. You can put them in there and it's, uh, it's flame retardant. Um, again, it's, it's good to be safe. Um, it's, it's, it's more of a rare occurrence than I think what you're, you're, you're being led to believe on the press. But it's, again, you see, I have a lipo bag, so I, I still use them too. Um, uh, another thing that I've, I've been learning uh, uh, as I've gone along here, now that we enter the winter months, if, if we ever do get a winter, um, it's December 23rd and it's about 65 degrees right now in uh, the Doylestown area. But um, anyway, lipos do not like being cold. It uh, drastically reduces their uh, their time and their efficiency to the point that they might just shut off. Uh, obviously, you don't want that in, in, in the air. Um, one thing to point out about um, automatically shutting off, unless it's a toy class, typically like these are sophisticated enough that um, they basically will not just run out of battery until they fall out of the sky. They know to self-land themselves. Uh, they might not care where they are, but they will like bring themselves down, kind of giving you a warning that, yeah, okay, hey, I'm, my battery's running low, you better land me. And if you ignore that, it's just going to go, oh, I'm going to land and turn myself off. Um, that's a very good feature, uh, obviously. So they're, they're built with the whole idea of safety that it's very hard, although problems can happen, it's very hard for them to just fall out of the sky and stop. Um, which is which is very good. So again, the best uh, tips I can give you is uh, fly it low, fly it slow. Do that for a while until you feel comfortable about it. Um, and again, if you see airplanes flying overhead, don't fly there. Uh, that's that's very very important. Um, again, as as time kind of goes on, uh, we'll. The next thing that'll happen is you'll start to see like regulations of where places that you can fly. Uh, right now, it's um, national parks and most state parks in Pennsylvania are off limits for flying. Um, and some uh, local municipalities are starting to kind of do their own thing, uh, whether you can fly in a park or not. Um, interesting about that is that uh, shortly after the FAA started the database, they came up with a ruling for states and local municipalities that basically says, well, not so fast in regulating where people can fly. That's our job. So um, next year would be pretty interesting to see. I, I, I recommend if you're really uh, serious in this hobby, um, please feel free to follow me. Uh, I do this podcast. Uh, I, I do this podcast every couple of weeks. And uh, I'll, I have like some good links and uh, to to places where you can uh, educate yourself on the what's really a fast changing world 
uh, for um, uh, quadcopters uh, in hobbyist and commercial professional applications. So uh, it, it, everything that I have that I've talked about on this show, if you go to my Medium account, there's the address on the screen there, uh, and then click on uh, Show 17, uh, you know, the, the new drone show, as I'm calling it. Uh, you'll find all the links to everything I talked about today, even some things about where to get the lipo bags and, and, and of that nature. Uh, you've also seen my Twitter handle, at DroneGuyTom, uh, flashing up on the screen there. So if you're on Twitter, please follow me. Um, and uh, my email address has been flashing up there too. So if, if you have any questions, uh, anything, especially if you're in the, the Bucks County area, that's, that's my home area, you know, I'd be happy to uh, answer questions, uh, give you advice and, and, and all that. But um, basically now you, now you have a, a quadcopter, congratulations. And um, it can be very fun, uh, really a lot of fun. Uh, again, with the fun comes the responsibility. And as, as I've mentioned earlier, that uh, as I'm finding out as time is moving on, uh, the FAA is very serious about uh, us uh, pilots having that responsibility. So um, be on the good side of that uh, and uh, take it easy. Have a very nice flight. And uh, I hope to see you uh, next time.